Hello and welcome. So while I'm waiting for some parts to arrive for the next actuator because I'm an idiot and ordered the wrong parts, I thought I would go over the CAD design for the Mark V suit. It's pretty much all there now and I've even been bothered to put it all on one file so you can see the suit build up. But before we jump into the CAD file I'll just go over briefly the composition of the armour itself. I have this old off-cut test piece here and as you can see you've got layers of hexagonal ceramic tiles and between each layer of ceramic tiles, you have layers of Kevlar separating the ceramic. Typically, it is two layers of ceramic with that separation layer of Kevlar and then a backing of Kevlar as well. It has proved to be effective. I do intend on doing a lot more testing before I build this next prototype, but I don't want to do the testing until I'm actually ready to build the prototype because I did start to find it difficult to get the same materials from the same manufacturer that I did with testing with before. As nearly unbelievable to me, I first made this armour and tested it in I think late 2021, maybe early 2022. So there was a gap between actually testing the armour and making the previous prototype, particularly as that's when I lost one eye, so there was quite a delay there. But rest assured, at some point in the future, there will be another video on armour. And then to actually cast this armour in the shapes that I want, in a way that will allow me to get a really good finish, what I'm going for is 3D printing and our casing for the armour, which is what you'll see on this CAD file. The idea being is that I'll have an hour face like this, this being a forearm piece, that I of course have not sanded yet, and the ceramic tiles, Kevlar, all of it will be bonded and layered in on the inside. And what I found making the previous prototype is it's very difficult to cut this armour, which is why I'm doing it like this. So that when all of this armour is laid and you've got excess going around the sides, I'll just be able to run a grinder or whatever cutting utensil truth to use around the edges really neatly, really fast, all the way around. Which will also mean I won't have to individually cut pieces of ceramic tile to fit in the corners of this. And then what I'll do is I'll have these 3D printed casings that are basically a casing ring that goes around the outside. These will then slot over the top of the piece like that of which here is one I assembled earlier. These will then be bonded together, bonded to all the composite, and give you a really good fit and finish, which is something that was lacking on the previous Mark IV prototype. It's worth noting that this isn't load supporting in any way. It is merely to ease manufacturing and to give a good finish. The armour itself is very structurally sound and strong and doesn't need supporting and therefore will actually support this. I hope that makes sense. With all that being said, we'll now jump into the CAD file. So we're gonna start off with the helmet because it's the most interesting looking part, let's be honest. So the best setup I've come up with so far is to have a main part of the helmet and then a visor that attaches onto it that can be lifted up out of the way. The current design is to have cameras in the eye sockets with screens on the inside as a display. This I think is the simplest option in a lot of ways, surprisingly. Uh, the difficulty of getting lenses to set in there properly uh, you're always going to have a bad vision essentially just trying to look through little you know polycarbon eye lenses and it means you always have to have a break in the armor to actually fit the lenses in whereas this way the visor can basically be one solid piece of armor with the cameras fitted and the wires laced through and then for breathing we've got the holes on the sides this is the best way i found to basically have breathing holes without making a shot trap at the front of the helmet and these strakes on the side of the helmet where the air holes are, that's actually more to have something to grip. So when you lift the visor up and down, you've actually got something to grab hold of, especially if you've got like a gauntlet on or something. The other important feature of the visor is the eye socket surrounds, which basically act as the brow and cheekbones around the eye sockets, which would hold the cameras. This then protects the cameras for any simple knocks and bangs, while frankly improving the look of the helmet as well. An important thing to note with these is that it's not a case of the eye sockets are set into the helmet, it's that the surrounds and the mouthpiece are actually set out from the helmet. That means that your internal space in the helmet is kept uniform and correct, and it also enables just the armour to be one continuous piece all the way around it. And then there's also some strakes on the back of the helmet, just again for grip when you take the helmet off, and there is of course this mohawk over the top, the idea of this is it's great for airflow, whether that's fan driven or just regular ventilation. It's also some way you can run wires through as well. And if it is gonna have ventilation holes in, I'll basically drill them from the side where they go in at an angle. So again, it's not a shot trap like a say roof scoop style that's on Space Marines. It'll just be from the side so you can't get any rounds or debris in. 
So to open the visor, what you'll do is you'll pull the visor forward and then rotate it back. That way it does clear the mohawk and the rest of the helmet. Now I did look at just having the visor completely cover the front of the helmet. So you kind of got added armor on the forehead. But then what I realized is the visor would have to sit 40 to 50 mil further out from the face to actually clear it all. So I worked out this is probably the best way of doing it. So you keep the helmet as small as possible and therefore lighter as possible and more comfortable. Oh, and I'll probably use magnets just to lock it in place when it is down. A big user issue that a visor solves over just having like a solid full face helmet is if you were doing everyday regular tasks like handling a phone or using a compass, for example, if you have an armored full face helmet without the visor, it just becomes very difficult to look down at your hands in front of you or perhaps your feet. You've obviously then got the issue of having to eat something or to drink something. You've either got to take the helmet off or have some system built in, whereas a visor just kind of gets rid of those issues. It also means if the optics are damaged, you can just lift the visor up. You don't have to take the entire helmet off. And it also gives a certain amount of modularity, which allows you to then fit different visors to it, fit upgraded visors, fit visors just with regular lenses if you want. You could just fit a polycarbonate visor. You could fit a visor with a respirator in it and basically chop and change and swap them out. There's always going to be compromises on the helmet designs, whether that's size and weight or vision or armor. So I've come to the conclusion that having that modularity in a visor where you can just swap it out is probably the best way to go. Moving on to the chest plate, there's a few points to note here. One is that the chest plate as displayed here is too long. I intend on making it a bit longer and then cutting it shorter so you can sit down easily in it. But something I can't really do with this armor is add armor to it. I can only subtract it so I made it longer on purpose. I've also tried to keep the shape as basic as possible so manufacturing becomes easier. And as you can hopefully see, this is rendered in carbon fiber. And that's because while most pieces of this armor are gonna be cast into 3D printer plastic to make it easier and for another feature that I'll explain later on, the size of the chest plate means I'll have to reinforce the plastic just to actually cast the armor into it. So at that point, I may as well get rid of the 3D printer plastic and just have a carbon fiber finish. Oh, and I have just put four holes on the chest plate so nut inserts can be mounted in for mounting points for pouches, straps, whatever else. And then onto the arms, unfortunately there won't be any big cool looking pauldrons for the simple reason you can't fit through doorways with them on. And for the same reason there won't be any rigid plate armour on the inside of the arms because you just can't bring your arms in tight enough. Now one of the reasons I do actually want a 3D printed plastic outer shell on the armour is that no matter what this is going to get scraped on walls, branches, stone, whatever it is. So you do actually want kind of a sacrificial layer to rub through. If you did just have a carbon fibre outer skin stretched over the ceramic Kevlar armour, you would then have the issue of scraping through the carbon fiber. And if any of you have broken carbon fiber, you'll know that when it breaks, it goes into those horrific ultra sharp needles that can embed into your skin incredibly deep very easily. So the last thing you would want to happen is to scrape through that carbon fiber and then end up touching it with your hands and then end up with all these needles of carbon fiber embedded into your skin. Now it's not such a problem for the chest plate because realistically, especially with pouches on, you're not really going to scrape anything on it. But for the arms and legs, they're definitely going to get scraped. And this does bring me on to the legs, which do give that Iron Man Mark 1 vibe. The thing that I found when I made the Mark 4 prototype is I did try to make them really well shaped and with a flare and look good. But it made them about three times more complicated to build than they should have been. And actually the biggest flaw in those legs were where they tapered in and went narrow. It just meant there was less room for the hinge and if anything they started to get a bit too tight on the legs. These are also backless. There was something about having the weight on the back of the legs before that just made it horrible even if they weren't actually touching the leg. Even though they are actually spotted by the exoskeleton, the mere presence of weight at the back of the legs just felt weird and far too uncomfortable for the benefits. Also with no backs, the bodily heating really isn't an issue. When the backs of the legs were on the Mark IV prototype, my legs did get quite hot wearing them, but as soon as the backs were released and removed, honestly, my legs didn't get hot at all. It also made it way easier and faster to put on the suit without fitting the backs onto the back of the legs as well. So all of these things combined have meant that I've left the backs off of this design. And I'm gonna cover the back of the legs up in a different way, which you will see soon. Now, when it comes to the boots, I had a lot of trial and error on the Mark IV prototype, with the boots in particular, meaning these will be much improved on the Mark V. They're much slimmer, much neater looking, will have a way better fit and finish, will be considerably lighter, and better in every way. They will work in roughly the same way, so basically you step into them from the back, 
the front toe caps, if you will, lift up. They can be packed with foam to ensure that when they are pressed down and strapped down with Velcro, they fit tight over the operator's boots, which the operator will be wearing when they step into the suit's boots. Hope that makes sense. These will largely be made out of carbon fiber and only lightly armored. It's better to keep as much weight off the end of the foot as possible. It's fine having weight on the thighs, but as you get further down the leg, the kind of lever point from your hips just gets a bit too much. As for the soles, these will be similar to the Mark IV prototypes in that they will be mounted on central flexible rubbers, packed out with foam to give the chosen rigidity and stability, with the tread pattern being a custom tread pattern that I designed, designed to allow you to rotate on the balls of your feet easier. This will be cast out of a high abrasion rubber resin into a semi-flexible carbon fibre sole, all of which will then be mounted to the boots. I have also tried to make these soles the right size so you could actually press the pedals in a vehicle, something definitely not possible in the old suit. However, these soles also will be removable. So if, for example, you did want to essentially fit snowshoes to the suit, you could literally just replace the soles themselves or attach a different type of boot sole that could have, say, custom clips that would allow snowshoes to be attached directly to them. And then these are definitely a work in progress, but I did want to show something about how to cover the hands while also protecting the hands from basically falling over. The idea being that you'd have these plates that extend out from the forearm and cover the top of the hand. These should also protect your hands if you fall over. Obviously, if you're wearing the suit, it's gonna be quite heavy. If you fall over onto your hands, you could hurt your hands. While I do intend on there being gloves to wear as well, the reasons why to not rely on a regular gauntlet anyway is one, without a really complicated wrist mechanism that's obviously likely to break and could be bulky, there's no way where the gauntlet can support the weight of the suit without transferring that weight through the wrist of the operator, which will no doubt cause injury from either falling over or if you want it to actually strike something, then again, you're putting all of the weight of the operator and the suit itself through the wrist, which is no good. And the second reason is if any of you have worked in the construction industry, you'll know it doesn't really matter which gloves you buy or wear, they don't really last two minutes as soon as or anything in abrasive. So you don't really want a special custom pair of gloves that have to be replaced all the time. Really, you just want to be able to replace them with regular, readily available gloves. Moving on to an issue you've probably all realised, and that is the gaps around the neck, the shoulders, the groin and the back of the legs. The best solution for these issues that I've been able to come up with is to have a garment that's basically made out of Kevlar and laced in individual hexagonal ceramic tiles. Any tiling will be strategically placed so you still have flexibility in the garment and the outer layer of the garment will also be waterproofed. Now I'm afraid you'll just have to forgive my rather low quality 3D modeling these garments. So to cover the shoulders and the neck, we've got this one piece hood. It'll basically sit over the top of the helmet, most likely magnetized to the back and the chest. It will go just wide enough than the shoulders to cover the edges of the shoulders and cover the majority of the gap between the arms and the chest plate while at least covering the gap at the side of the neck and the back of the neck. One reason it's a full hood piece is because I wanted to try to stop rainwater from actually getting down the back of your neck, down the sides of the chest plate and wherever else that could be quite annoying at a bare minimum. And I don't intend on having it where it kind of splits in half just because I actually think it'll be harder to put on where if it's just one piece that literally goes over the top of your head magnetizers, it should be pretty easy for the operator to actually put on themselves. I expect to make in the inside of the hood ribbed, so the hood is basically self-supporting, so the weight isn't on the helmet. And while you can't really see it in this modeling, you will be able to obviously rotate your head and the hood part will move with the helmet so it doesn't obstruct your vision. And down to the groin cover, this will be two pieces of overlapping garment. I found this overlap in the center to be beneficial as it does allow the pad to kind of flex a bit more around the legs, particularly when you're moving and walking forward. It also allows the cover to be wider at the sides without it getting in the way of your movement, which is necessary because you do want the groin cover to overlap the quad armor just so it doesn't get caught on the edge of the quad armor. As if it does, it will have a tendency to want to go down the back of the quad armor instead of over the top of it. This will be mounted onto the waist belt of the exoskeleton, allowing it to move freely from the chest piece. And this will allow it to be adjusted and lifted up in case you do need to go to the toilet. Another plus of doing it this way instead of having a groin piece made out of solid plate armor. Moving on to covering the back of the legs. This will be kind of half a cloak or half a tabard, don't really know what you call it. It'll attach to the pelvis of the exoskeleton because I worked out on the previous prototype that if it's attached there, it doesn't get in the way. When you sit down, it kind of doesn't go tight and risk tearing off and it basically behaves like a hoodie that's been tied around your waist, i.e. it really doesn't get in the way. An additional plus with this is it'll basically act as a weather break. It'll help stop rain getting in, the cold getting in, while also allowing the user's body heat to escape out of the back of the legs. Speaking of which, I do think this would help to hide some thermal radiation, so you should show up less on thermal imaging. 
because while it won't radiate much from the plate armour itself, if you've got the back of the legs open, it will show from the back. And lastly, one big reason to use this type of design instead of a piece of plate armour over the glutes is if you say break out into a jog or a run and then have to take a knee and kneel down, that piece of plate armour would have to extend and contract by an incredibly large margin to actually cover your glutes, thereby actually making it very difficult to get the coverage required, whereas using this type of cloak method basically solves those issues. And that about brings us to the end. I'll probably go over more of the exoskeleton in another video and more of the progress on the printing so far. Ideally when I get a bit further along, so there's more to show. But if this project intrigues you, please like and subscribe and follow along. I should actually have some actuator videos coming out soon. And I've also got some Warhammer nerd stuff coming out as well. So yeah, I hope you have a great day and I hope to see you in the next video.